Welcome, my name is Sue Gordon. I'm from the Career Center. I'm Director of Career Development. And I'm happy to uh, have helped organize this panel with our lead help in the Program Center for Career Development. And we wanted to talk with everybody and have a conversation amongst um, faculty from different schools about what are some ways that we can connect the curriculum to careers. And I know I've personally been doing a lot of thinking, as a lot of people have, about how we can connect liberal arts education to careers. As probably everybody in this room is aware, there seems to be a huge media offensive, actually, against uh, liberal arts and careers and a big push out there for more vocational training and things like that. And, that. and that's created demand from parents and from students to say, if I major in one of these, a social science or a liberal arts, a humanities and arts, what does that, how does that impact me career-wise? And I think all of us who are from a liberal arts or that kind of perspective understand that liberal arts and careers do indeed connect. It's just we're trained in a more broad and a different way. But how are some ways that we can help make sure those outcomes are there for our students? How is, what are the ways that we can integrate some ideas that they do get some of the first practical across the educational spectrum? And we're already doing a lot of that at American University. So that's why we pulled together this panel, was to bring together faculty from across different schools to take a look at what's already going on in the classroom, both at an undergraduate and, and graduate level. And also, Arlene and I are going to talk about what we are doing <coughs> through a career center perspective on helping to educate students really directly about that concept of career. So I'm gonna, we're going to begin by Arlene and I talking about what our two centers do. And then I'm going to pass it off to these lovely faculty to they'll introduce themselves. Um, we have Judy Shapiro from SIS, Lynn Arneson from CIS, we have Pam O'Leary from Wyndham and Gender and Sexuality Studies, did I get that correct? Yeah. And Rick Stack from SOC. So we'll move on to that in a little bit. So I'll start with the career course that the Career Center just started this past semester and is going into its second semester. This is a one credit course that is offered to undergraduates that helps them really explore the concepts of um, career development, what are some things that they need to understand about themselves in reference to career, and also some practical skills to help them get started down the road to career. At this point, it, um, it is appropriate for freshmen through seniors, and we'll be taking a look at possibly differentiating that over time a little bit more. But it really looks at we do self-assessment to help them understand themselves, to understand how um, their personality, interests, values fit into the world of career, into for the younger students, how they pick their major, and how that major can help them connect into careers. So they are assigned projects such as doing informational interviews to talk to people who are further along um, in that major or in a career and to learn more about how to make those connections. They are taught some really practical skills about how to find internships and how to find jobs. So we help them connect that whole big picture. Um, and we had 15 students in the fall and it went really well and we're fully enrolled at 25 for the spring semester so I'm really excited. And I'll be practicing some more differenti differentiated education in the spring because I actually have all four years in the class from what I can tell. In the, in the fall it was marketed heavily to freshmen so it was very younger student centric. So. One of the ways I'll do that, it might, for an informational interview, it might be okay for a freshman to talk to a senior who's done three internships and is further on, but a senior is going to have to talk to an actual employer. So, Arlene, you want to talk about what the Cogat Center does? Sure. So my name is Arlene Hill, and I'm the director of the Cogat Center for Career Development. Um, but I also have to say that my background is much more in serving the liberal arts students and being a liberal arts student. Um, and just want to say as a, <coughs> as a um, disclaimer is that one of the things I think that people think is because we're the school of business, it more directly connects to curriculum, um, the outcomes with careers. And yet, one thing I would just kind of put out there for people to think about is the survey by the National Association of Colleges and Employers in terms of what it is that employers really want out of college students and what they look for when they hire. Um, the top two skills are things that definitely come from a broad education and come from a liberal arts background interpersonal skills and communication skills. So those are, you know, they're, they're not quant, they're not quant skills, they're not specifically business skills. They're um, followed right after that tends to be writing skills. So things that are the core of the liberal arts curriculum 
are things that employers across industries really want from their students. Um, specifically within the COVAD Center for Career Development and through COVAD, we offer two career <coughs> courses, um, and these are open to students from any uh, of the schools. The first one is much more about self-assessment and really helping students figure out um, kind of who they are, what their values and interests and personality skills are, and how that translates potentially into career fields they might want to consider, so it's much more self-assessment based. The second course, KSB 300, is much more targeted towards juniors and seniors, and it's about how do you define a brand for yourself? Um, how is it that you think about the skills that you've developed, and how do you then think about where that fits in the marketplace, where employers might want those skills, and how do you target and apply for those types of positions? Um, and then additionally, uh, if we have a chance, we'll talk about some of the services that we provide. Our faculty do a lot of experiential education um, within the curriculum that we help connect them with potential employers that they have in the classrooms as well. Um, so that's something that we can provide as well. I'd like to further that conversation after we've talked about how the career centers can partner with faculty in helping you to integrate these concepts. So with that, I'm gonna ask my distinguished panel to tell a little bit or talk introduce yourselves and how how is it that right now all of you are right now doing some things that connect your curriculum into the world of career for your students so judy if you don't mind i'll have sure. you start since you're down at the end hi everybody um as i was leaving the house this morning i told my husband what i was doing he said oh you're good at that and i actually haven't thought of myself as a career teacher but um, I want to use a little different language here. Um, there's a very famous quotation from Viktor Frankl who wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And he says that we should encourage ourselves not to ask what we want to get from life, but rather what life wants to get from us. I think it's really profound. Mm -hmm. And that's my approach with my students. Um, I think uh, it's hard for them sometimes to envision what all the possibilities are out there. Um, what they need to do is sort of dive in and experience things and then listen to what resonates for them and then rise to that occasion. So um, I think that education's goal is not to help people find a good job, uh, but rather to give them the tools to make good decisions, to construct a meaningful life for themselves. You know? And that could be a different answer for many different students. That said, um, I do uh, do a lot of things in my classes to connect uh, I don't know, learning with the real world. Um, and one thing I do that might be useful for you guys is I think a lot of us bring in students from, from Washington, D.C. But I try to make a point in every course to go downtown, to bring them down. Because when you actually go into the physical setting, uh, it's a whole different story and you're not just meeting with one person, you're meeting with several people and you can grab the president as he walks by or she walks by and they have a feeling that they understand uh, the institution. And then I try to get my speakers to tell us how did you end up doing what you're doing now. Another thing uh, that I try to work with my students on is to get them to be less frightened um, that the decision they make when they first graduate is going to color the rest of their lives. Uh, it's a journey and one way that I know that is I do stay in touch with all of our alumni <coughs> on LinkedIn and I can see that 10 years out they're in an entirely different place than they were when they first graduated. And that's very exciting for me. And um, so that's just something that's fun to do. Um, and I also encourage them to know that even the bad decisions can be important learning experiences. I mean, I think in my life I've made at least two fairly bad career decisions. And, you know, but I still wouldn't be here now, which is a good decision, if I hadn't made those bad decisions. So um, that's okay. Uh, another thing I do in my courses is I do try to integrate some actual policy documents into the reading. So it's not, certainly not textbooks, but um, people can see how people in the real world have to, you know, deal with um, uh, writing. And finally, I mean, even for my MA students, I'm in the Global Environmental Policy Program, and even there, it's not just one career choice. 
Are you going to be an activist? Are you going to be a teacher? Do you have a tolerance for <coughs> writing memoranda in the State Department and all of the negotiations that are around that? Uh, do you love research or do you like you know, dealing with the health? These are very different kinds of choices. And that's something I think a lot of students that come into our global environmental policy program and they think that they decide on their career and then they realize how incredibly vast and complex um, the choices are. Uh, finally, I guess, uh, getting a little bit to what you guys were saying there, writing and speaking, writing and speaking, writing and speaking. Um, if you can write, then you can communicate what you want. What you want, um, if you have that mistake on your cover letter, forget it. So I work very, very closely with my students on that. Those are just my, my thoughts. I know we have a big panel, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Your turn. <coughs> Um, my name is Lynn Arneson. Um, I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences in the Dean's Office, and I wear a number of different hats. Um, I'm the pre-medical programs coordinator, so I help all of our students across campus um, prepare for and apply to uh, all of the schools of the health professions, medical, dental, pharmacy, physical therapy, physician <coughs> assistant, a variety of different things. I'm also the interim director of the new public health program. And I also teach in the uh, Department of Biology and College of Arts and Sciences. So um, I, I guess I kind of approach helping students to prepare for uh, careers in a number of different ways. One of the things I've done with the pre-med program is to start a zero credit class, um, primarily for freshmen. Um, it's easy to sell because it's no homework and no tuition. So <laughs> the students and the parents are quite happy about it. But I think it's really important because most of the students who come in and identify as pre-med want to become physicians. That's primarily what they know is they see doctors and they see dentists. And that's pretty much it. They don't really have an idea of what pharmacists do other than give you medication. They don't know what a podiatrist does. They don't know what nurse practitioners are or physician assistants. So I feel that it's very important to introduce these students to a wide variety of health professionals to give them a better idea of what these people do on a daily basis, the advantages. I actually ask our guest speakers to talk about what they don't like about their job. So to introduce the students to a variety of different careers that are available in the health professions. The majority stick with medical school, which is great, but they come at it from a more knowledgeable position. I also take the opportunity to sneak in all of the extra stuff that will help them on their journey towards medical school. So applying, preparing for and applying to medical school is a very long process. They need to do a lot of things. They need to gain clinical experience. They need to gain research experience. And you can't start this your junior year and hope to become a good applicant. So if I can grab them as freshmen, I can give them all the information that they need to become a very competitive applicant. So that's one of the things that I do. Um, in the public health program, and I can talk about all of these things more if you'd like, I'm just giving you a kind of a brief overview. Um, the public health program is relatively new. This is its third year in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, it's a fairly practical type of major, and yet there are a huge variety of careers <coughs> available within public health. So it's very important that the students have an opportunity to explore the different avenues in public health, and we do this through a number of different ways. We have career panels. Um, we have uh, the, we require the students to do an internship, so they identify an area that they're interested in, and then they go and, and experience firsthand. We also require them to do a capstone project. Um, so in their senior capstone, we're holding that class this spring for the second time. Um, we ask groups of students to partner with an organization on a project, and they do it with the the um, DC organization, so that they have a product and on their resume and, and it's actually helped. The first time we ran it, it helped them get jobs. So it was really helpful. And I can talk about that more. Um, we actually start this process, we can start this process as freshmen. I teach a public health course for the university college and um, I can talk volumes about the UC if you'd like, but it's a fantastic program. It gives the students an opportunity to go out and talk with a variety of different public health professionals as freshmen to see what it is they can do with this type of major. Um, and then I also teach the senior seminar in biology. One of the um, uh, assignments we have them do is to go out and talk with biology professionals, three of them, 
um, and complete a survey. So find out what these individuals do, um, talk about the different types of careers they can, they can have as biology majors. Um, and I'm going to stop there. There's a lot more, but turn it over to. Um, I'm Pamela O'Leary. I'm an adjunct in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. I teach gender, power, and politics. I was recently the executive director of the Public Leadership Education Network, a nonprofit in D.C. that trains college women for public policy careers. So I will briefly give you my bullet points, and then I'll go just a little bit in depth. Um, so I do through assignments, through lecturing about skills training, guest speakers, bringing campus resources, such as the Career Center class, encouraging students to come to office hours just to talk about career-related stuff, um, posting opportunities on Blackboard, and the letter of recommenda recommendations. So for my assignments, um, I try to do um, give them public speaking skills exercises. So they have an individual presentation, a three-minute individual presentation. So it's, my class is about generally women leaders, gender power, and politics. So they do an individual presentation on a paper that they wrote about a female leader, and then they do a group project on an organization that works um, with women social change, so mostly nonprofits. Um, and then they also do a group presentation where they, each person has to speak in front of the class. Um, writing assignments, um, <laughs> they kind of hate this. Um, I think I have a very different writing style than many other professors here. Um, in addition to a final five to seven page paper, I, which is more of just regular academic, I have um, five short reflection papers throughout the semester that are two pages and they're more or less kind of a policy memo style of get to your point, get to your point, get to your point, make your argument, be succinct as one would write for nonprofits or for the Hill. Um, and that's a big adjustment I think for that, so providing them feedback on this is what I'm looking for and I'm, it's a different style, but I think that's an incredibly valuable, as we said, writing is one of the most important skills. Um, also with extra credit assignments, um, I encourage them as much as possible to get off campus, go into the city. So they get extra credit if they do an informational interview, and then they also get extra credit if they attend a um, off-campus networking event and just talk about what that experience is like for them. Um, I do lectures about how to, because, you know, before I just send them off into the world, like how, how to do networking, how to do an informational interview. Um, when they do their PowerPoint presentations, here's what a good PowerPoint presentation is like, and going through that in detail. Here's what a good public speaking presentation is. Um, hires different creative ways to be um, unique in your presentation. So doing actual lectures on those. I have lots of guest speakers. Um, I actually also teach at Trinity, and I became a, a professor at Trinity because I was a guest speaker. There's more than enough people in D.C. who would love and be flattered by the opportunity to come to campus and share. Um, and this is also a way to recruit uh, potential adjuncts. Um, and when I have the guest speakers, I prompt them on things that I want them to talk about in terms of content of the class, but also talking about their career path, talking about um, career advice. Um, and so and I also bring a lot of female speakers because we need to show the students role models, and I have predominantly female students. Uh, bringing all the campus resources, you would think that with all the fairs that they have um, and all the tabling that they would know about all the free resources, but they really don't. So having, having the <laughs> resources uh, come to class and just do a little brief presentation in the beginning of class uh, really helps. I brought in uh, lots of different student groups as well. Um, CSLP, I'm not sure exactly what that stands for, but service learning. Um, so students can do the extra um, units and do the internship and get credit. And also I brought in um, the counseling center because, and a lot of the students came to me and said, I didn't know I get free therapy, that's awesome. And they ended up doing that. And that's, I think that's really important. I also framed it as like leaders know when to ask for help and to take help. And so, you know, even we don't think of that, but telling them to get therapy and that it's okay to get therapy. Um, Encouraging them to come in my office hours, even if it's not to talk about assignments, but just to talk generally about life and career advice. Uh, posting on Blackboard, lots of, I did it like a, I posted on my personal social networks, like does anybody need an intern this semester still, even though it was a few uh, weeks into the semester. Um, and so I did a poll of all the different internship opportunities that I had directly connected to and posted that to the students, as well as just different networking events. 
And then for the letters of recommendation, um, in the beginning of the semester, I was like, I'm happy to do this for you, but I better, I need to know you. I, I, I need um, to have a relationship with you. So kind of really putting that out there because um, they want that letters of recommendation, but if they know that they kind of have to work for it, that helps as well. Um, let me preface my comments by saying I think there are certain disciplines on campus that, that lend themselves more easily to the campus career connection. Um, so I was very happy to hear what you had to say because I didn't think yours was one of those perhaps. <laughs> um, but I know mine is. Um, uh, I'm Rick Stack. I teach in School of Communication. I teach a variety of undergraduate and graduate classes. Um, my theme in my classes is communication for social change. So there are certain students in the class that resonate with my uh, philosophy uh, and others don't, and, and that's fine. Um, I start the class by asking them, tell me what you're passionate about. Let's start there, okay? Um, the, at the sophomore level, the intro to public relations class that I teach, um, those students really don't have a clue as to what the profession's about, what the discipline's about, so I said, Let's start internally. Let's start with what you're interested about. What drives you? What are you passionate about? And it'll be my challenge throughout the semester to show you how this discipline, how communication, can connect with whatever you're interested in to create a very satisfying life for you, or a rewarding, fulfilling uh, profession, career, um, life, that, uh, beyond profession and, and career, <coughs> uh, a fulfilling, rewarding life. And one of the things I do to get to know them better, uh, a little trick I've been using the first day of class uh, for many, many years, is I ask them to write a letter of recommendation for themselves, about themselves, by themselves. Um, and after I read that, I get a real good head start on knowing who they are, who they think they are, and also knowing their writing flaws uh, really early on, and, and that facilitates my process of getting to know each student uh, as an individual, and it reinforces this idea, tell me what you're passionate about. And I said, don't be asking. You know, if, if you're passionate about bowling, if you're passionate about sewing, wh whatever it may be, you know, let me know because I can guide you in a direction that will link you to a career that focuses on bowling, you know, if, if, that, if that's what you like to do. There's no you know, don't, don't butter me up. Let me, let me know what you're really interested in. So I try to customize um, my approach to the students uh, as much as I can. Um, the assignments, uh, I, I liked uh, your approach here um, as well. I, in each of my classes, I pluck out an assignment that is very much geared to emphasizing the career aspect of what a student can do. In the in that intro class, COM 301, it's, it's our gateway class from uh, the courses that they've taken before to, it, it, it really, it cuts some students off at the knees. They've got to get a B or better to continue with the curriculum, but this is, this is the one at the get-go. They're sophomores. During the semester, I ask them to go out and interview a professional public relations practitioner, a public communication specialist. It could be public affairs, public relations, uh, again, the area that they're most interested in. In the syllabus, I've already scripted out the basics of the interview. I say, look, this isn't exactly one size fits all, but this should give you the courage to make a phone call, to knock on a door, to set up an appointment, and interview a professional of your choosing and, you know, I'll consult with them throughout the semester if they're having a hard time finding somebody. Um, and I so said, I want you to march in that office with this script of an informational interview and use this as a starting point, a, a point uh, of departure for going into other directions that you're interested in, that your interview subject is interested in, but really, you know, dive deeply into, again, I come back to that word passion, what you're passionate about. Um, and I have to say, oh, and, and, and then towards the end of the semester, I asked them all to make a presentation to the rest of the class on the interview that they just conducted, um, which gives them all an opportunity to speak, that, that critical um, skill. It also gives them an opportunity to learn not only the interview that they conducted, 
but 20 other uh, experiences they all get to, to benefit from. And, and, and many of them will begin passing around information and say, wow, I'd really like to learn more about the place that you just interviewed. Can you give me that uh, email, that phone number, that connection? So, so that happens. And better yet, I would say over the course of this particular assignment, a good 50%, if not more, of the students that have done that assignment, they all have to do this assignment, have gotten an internship out of it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is at the sophomore level. So they, they, they're, they're ready the summer after the sophomore year to jump into um, an actual internship with someone that they've spent an hour or more getting to know. Um, and so that helps guide them in that direction. Um, in an upper level undergraduate class that I teach, the Public Relations Case Studies class. As the name implies, we spend the semester looking at case studies, both successful and unsuccessful campaigns uh, that have either met their mission or failed, and we analyze why. Um, I struck upon this assignment kind of by accident, but when it, when it was brought home to me that, that the students really liked this, I said, all right, let's go with this. Um, a few years ago, what I would do um, if, a, if a student was struggling throughout the first part, middle part of the semester, um, as we were getting down to the final month, I'd say, look, I want to give you an opportunity to make up the poor midterm or the, the term paper that you've handed in and I go over you know, where they've missed. But I said, look, I'll give you an extra credit assignment. You take me up on this and I can factor that into your grade. The, the grade, as most of you realize, it doesn't mean that much to us, but it's a motivator for the students. But I try to really build in a much more substantial motivator. Um, I said, what I want you to do I want you to study the industry, or better yet, the company of your dreams. I want you to study the industry trends of that company. I want you to try to project into the future where their issues are going to be. And I want you to write a case study based on all the case studies we've, we've studied so far in the semester, a customized case study based on that company's needs, okay? You give that to me, and that's your extra credit. The students that did that said, this is such a great assignment. Why don't you have everybody do this? And I said, I don't know. Why don't I have everybody do this? <laughs> and so that's what I do now. And from the get-go, day one of, of the semester, when I, when I pass out the syllabus and we start talking about it, I say, this is what I want you to be thinking about from this moment forward. And this is yet another way of me gently kicking them in their behind and saying, you really need to start thinking about where you want to go with your life and how you want to pull all of these concepts and principles and, strateg and strategies and tactics together to make a meaningful life for yourself. And I'm asking you now, if you haven't thought about it, what would be the job of your dreams? And I definitely agree that the job of their dreams today is not the one they're going to have down the road. And that's something else I try to disabuse themselves of, is that, hey, look, you know, maybe you've been brought up to believe you, you get your diploma on Sunday and you start the job of your dreams on Monday <laughs> and you're going to live happily ever after. <laughs> it ain't going to work that way. And one of the ways I reinforce that idea is to bring in guest speakers. And when I can, in fact, I pride myself on this. I've been teaching long enough that I've got a terrific uh, uh, contingency of students that are former students that are out there being very successful uh, in different fields of public communication. I ask them to come in, and, and particularly, I like to bring in students uh, that were sitting in the very former students that were sitting in the very chairs of these current students two, three, four, five years ago. And I feel like it's. Um, a mutual favor. I mean, I appreciate them coming in and sharing their time and expertise with me, but I also feel like it's my way of giving them, even though they've finished, they've graduated, they've got their degrees, yet another opportunity to hone those speaking skills, to come in, to, to be able to put guest lecturer on their resume. Um, I mean, they, they get a real kick out of it. It's very easy to solicit, you know, those students. And what I do to, to boost their confidence as they're prepping their lesson plan, I say, look, 
What I want you to remember is you are imparting equal parts information and inspiration. Those students will, they, they will be hanging on your every word, especially your personal history. You know, they, they want to know how you got from point A, the chair in this classroom, to point B, this cool job that you're doing right now. Um, and even the ones that have only been out three, four, five years may have had three, four, five uh, different jobs. Um, at the graduate level, when I know I've got students that have more um, backgrounds, more, more uh, expertise, a stronger skill set, um, their term project will be, uh, I, I team them up, and as much as they hate group projects, I say, look, this is the way it works in the real world. Um, I want you to learn how to function in a group, so we spend a lot of time on that. And then I want you to take all of the principles that we've been talking about to this point in the semester. The course is called The Principles of Strategic Communication. Uh, and I say, I'm going to assign you, I, I break them up into teams of fours and fives, and I assign them a real deal, live, nonprofit organization. Some of them are campus groups, so it's very easy. That there's no excuse why they, they can't uh, get to them, to, uh, see them. Uh, and they ha their challenge is to, to uh, learn how to work with each other, learn client relations, how, how you deal with, with a client who may or may not be uh, cooperative. They're, they're all appreciative of, of the students' efforts. Um, and thirdly, to, to design a public communication outreach campaign that meets the needs of this particular organization. So, and, and with, with those um, experiences behind them, uh, they can slip that sort of assignment into their personal writing portfolio and students have come back to me and say, hey, you know, that assignment really helped get me my first job. So, <clears throat> I think I've blabbed enough. That, that's, that's good for, for, for now and, and uh, let's continue. Um, so, I'm just going to add a follow-up question that actually includes the whole audience. So we've had, heard a lot of great examples of assignments. Um, informational interviews, taking students down to have guest speakers in downtown or, or in the classroom, case studies. What are some other assignments that you can think of that might not be mentioned or folks in the audience, what assignments might you have used that integrate and expose the students to, to um, the real world? I actually teach a two practica for School of International Service where my students are divided into Deloitte-like consulting teams and they have to do a research project and a final oral presentation to an actual real-life multinational mm -hmm. corporation. It's a very formal, this is, this exactly, is it. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Kind of similar to what you were right, right. It's, not, it's more than theoretical. It's, it's, it's practical, it's mm -hmm. actual. And the clients, I have to say, have been very grateful. In one case, last semester where one of the student teams, and the students are teams are of three to four students, worked for the National Geographic Society. Five years ago, the National Geographic Society spent $8,000 on an actual consulting <coughs> firm on the same question that my students did. They hated the results of the consulting firm. They threw it in the trash. <laughs> and they loved my students' recommendations <laughs> because my students could, according to the VP at National Geographic, think out of the box. Of course, the students were given access to the prior consulting company's mm -hmm. approach, but the consulting company naturally were advocated. I also teach uh, practicums. Uh, I think we overdo the practica. Uh, <laughs> Latin. Um, <laughs> uh, pioneered the one we did for the World Resources Institute last year. And this year we're continuing it. And sorry, can you not see me? Um, and this year we're continuing it and doing a practicum on Chinese investment in mining in Peru. And that has sort of evolved to having a second client because uh, we're now working for the Inter American Dialogue as well. And there are a couple of mini projects that are actually going to be paid. Uh, so, again, the value of taking people downtown to the Inter-American Dialogue or to the Peterson Institute or wherever we're going to be going before the students actually go to Peru in March um, will really give them some good opportunities. I think last year my observation of the students was that knowing that they were going to have to present at WRI 
uh, in that kind of formal setting really put the fire under their feet. They were nervous about it and they worked really hard. So not that they're not afraid of us as well, but I think they have something different about going downtown to present your material. So. Yeah, I'm also from the School of Communication, Film and Media Arts Division, and I teach um, film and video production. And uh, we have documentary and fiction and narrative. And what I do is also connect them also with the real world. In documentary, I send them out to non-profit organizations to do, they have to do an interview assignment, you know, to film a person, to do an interview on camera. But it's very uh, challenging for them, first of all, because they have to, first of all, to, set, to have the technical skills, to, to be able to do it in practice in class, and then they uh, have to do that contact to that nonprofit organization. And that is some, something with the real world, because as a filmmaker in the real world, it's very difficult to get access you know, to interviewing someone. And uh, a lot of the students, uh, the, the learning curve goes really like this. You know, when they try to do phone call and phone again and phone again, get the access, and finally, when they are then there in that interview, uh, you know, getting the lights right and the camera, after that interview, they have learned so much, and that is um, for them, um, they feel very empowered after this, you know, to, to approach in the next project or so. That's uh, beautiful. In, that, in narrative casting, for example, they need actors for their, uh, for their exercises, and uh, then they have to reach out to the theatre department or, you know, to Craigslist and, and get these people and have to deal with real people and, and get all what you can get, you know, when you get these people called, you know, actors who you know, act for free. And, um, and I think these are very, very uh, important experiences in, in these classes, you know, to, to connect with the real world. And they do their mistakes and everything, but I always say, you know, that is, you know, doing mistakes, you learn by these mistakes, you know. That you have to, we have all, we as filmmakers, we have to go through all these mistakes because that is what, what you really, um, what, what brings you up. You're not being graded on your mista mistakes, you're being graded on your uh, learning curve, what, 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 you, what you are having, showing here in the class. And, uh, that motivates them there. And they, 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 they feel like empowered and come back to class. And, uh, and my class um, atmosphere is always very uh, communicative and collegial teamwork, I love it very much, you know, because it's that, that's what in, in real world in film and video production, you have to you know, rely on teamwork. Right. Yeah. I have a question to follow up. You said that you grade on the learning curve, what they learned. Does anybody, can anybody found more about the challenge of evaluating these experiences? Yeah, well, it, well, the first exercise I do, for example, in the class is, is uh, uh, an exercise on that. I ask them, um, how do you learn, right, first? How, no, what, 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 no, first I ask one question. What is the best what you do in life? What is the best what you do? And they write it down, you know. And we never, sh they never share that. And then I ask, how did you get to that? How did you, how, how did you become so good at that? Could be cooking, could be ice skating, could whatever, how, you know? And then they say, oh, reading, na, 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 na. And then I get, you know, I get the answers, you write them down, and normally, Oh, it's the same. They say reading, practice, da 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 da, and then we vote on the answers, right? And the most votes come always to the trial and error. You know, people learn when they do, uh, they do it, and then th that is a, the, the best learning curve. You know, trial and error, and film in production that is trial and error. And at the end, uh, I tell you, that's exactly what you're going to be doing in this course: trial and error all the time, trail and error. And that is a learning curve you're going to be making. And I will be grading, I, I've been observing how you do it. And at the end, and that you can grade that. I mean, I, I see my, in film video product it's easy because I see what comes back on camera. You know, they have to cut, they have, I see the videos, you know, and I see exactly what they have learned. You, you, you see a video and you see everything, what, what, what they do wrong, from sound to light to directing to everything. You see it on, on the video. So for me it's easy to, 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 to see it and grade it over the time. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I, I, we've talked a lot about some of the more applied majors and Pam, I guess. Yeah, um, something else that I do at a strategic point in the, uh, in the semester uh, is bring in a career center expert. Um, <laughs> for many, many years it was Marie Spaulding. Uh, now it's Felicia Parks. Um, and I asked them to lead a class discussion 
um, based on the questions that the students have on writing cover letters, um, creating the resumes, and going through interviews. And I put this in the context of the class, communication is all about spreading information or being persuasive, persuasion. And say, okay, now it's time for you to sell you. And these are the tools you need to do it. And so, you know, we spend uh, a session on that uh, just about the time of the semester that they're thinking about their, um, their, their, their summer jobs or in internships. And I think that, that, that really solidifies this connection between uh, at least my curriculum and the person. Just one more thing. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, I'm Kihan Fernando. I'm the executive director of the Career Center. Um, I'm, I apologize for being a few minutes late this morning, but I have a very good and relevant excuse. <laughs> so I just returned um, this morning by train from New York, where um, my office, Arlene's office, um, many faculty and administrators in both COGAD and SOC and our alumni office collaborate to uh, organize a trip which takes, uh, on this occasion, took uh, 75 students up to New York to visit with 23 different sites, um, uh, employer sites. And so it ranged from everything from the New York Times um, on the print journalism side through to um, Bravo uh, Network for you know cable entertainment and, and so on, uh, sort of a wide range of well-regarded um, and significant groups. And so we, the students had typically, each student would typically meet with maybe six different sites along the way. And it was incredibly eye-opening. It's my first time going on this, this visit. And to see the incredible learning that you all are describing uh, coming out of those interactions that the students have with the alumni in many cases, and in some cases just uh, you know, professionals in those, those particular fields um, was really, really significant. And it's, uh, uh, several of those uh, visits originate from connections that faculty or uh, alumni or administrators will have with, uh, with people at those organizations. And so that's yet another way that we can try to um, help build those connections between students and, um, and uh, the workplace. And Rick, thank you for the little plug. Um, my office, and I know Arlene's office too, is really, really, um, we want to collaborate with you all. It's not, and I love the fact that at AU we don't have this sort of separation of like careers over here, just go to the office for the people who do that, but that there's this significant interaction with, uh, between the, the faculty, the administration, and uh, those of us who do this for our living. And we definitely, all of our career advisories are available to come in to do um, the classroom talks with your students about a topic of your course. So like Lynn, I'm coming in and doing resumes for biology students at the end of the month and, and a strong interest in mentoring for your, your health students. So, yeah. um, so we do that. You just get in touch with either directly with the advisor for your school or, or with me and I can get it to the right advisor. Um, uh, and we are organized within the main career center that there are um, at least two full-time advisors for every, for SOC, CAS, SPA, and SIS, and of course our main is COGAT, and I'm sure they're willing to help in similar manners. Um, we were talking about uh, the, the practical assignments and a lot of the, the more applied kind of disciplines talk, and I'm wondering, is there anybody in the room who's more from one of the less direct careers, such as history, English, things like that, and you, you're, you've represented some great ideas, but are there any more ideas of how you might connect a history major, for example, into the world of work and how their major might influence, might might connect to that? Any of you have any thoughts or ideas in that area? Yes, in the back. For some of you know, I was at Maryland for many years and had businesses, all like the uh, arts and sciences, uh, invite people to come back who majored in history or English or some of the less professionally oriented fields who have become uh, association executives who work in research at the Smithsonian who have exciting careers and then they do the visits to New York and to the to downtown to see those people at work and it is it's very exciting for the students to, to do those things. 
I'm going to piggyback on that. I'm going to take on my colleague Marie to talk about the career nights that we do at CAS. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, Marie, she's CAS career advisor. Yeah, I, I work in the career center with um, College of Arts and Sciences students. We have worked with individual departments, history, literature, philosophy, women and gender studies, women and science, which is not a department, but um, I think, is there another? Languages. Low languages, uh, world languages. Um, to work with them to pull together alumni who they would like the students to hear from to find out what these alums have done. You know, how did they, how they use their degree in history, literature, et cetera, and what are they up to now? Um, and we facilitate this. We have somebody in our staff, uh, Kate, who works with them on the logistics if, they, if the departments would like help with that. And then we invite the um, alums, usually four to five to six, somewhere in there, to come back usually in the evening. The, de the department pays for pizza, which is important. The students come because there's food. Um, but it's just, it's generally incredibly well attended. We've had up to 60 students actually come. They're always in the evening. Um, and, you know, they, they go with different formats. Some of the departments, um, you know, they just have different ways of doing it. But the point is that the, each of the alums talk about sort of how they got where they are. But then the students, after the panel is done, the students are very eager to go up and talk individually. Another good exercise is to ask somebody who was a business major or a journalism major, what was your most important course in college? And very often they'll say philosophy mm. or <laughs> English or you know, whatever. It, and that is a nice exercise. Too. Two. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeff Sosslin, I'm from the Prospects School of Professional Extended Studies. And a, a lot of the things that, that our faculty uses, informational interviews, uh, I internships in particular, and that's sort of the arrow going from the classroom to career. But another important discussion to think about in this room is reversing the arrow uh, from the real world into the classroom. And something that's a, a big challenge, but it's very important, is the student's experience at the internship or with the guest speakers, how that can be used to explain some very abstract theoretical points. I teach international business, but they're maybe not good at they're thinking when they're reading the textbook or I'm lecturing on it, it's not very important and it doesn't make any sense. But when you can make that connection between this really is something significant and this is a way that you can really understand it. So thinking about sort of not just getting them you know, into their career, but also how that real world experience is going to um, enrich the, the classroom experience. And, and, and how that's in the requirements in the class, be it for the papers or whatever, how, how you do that. I have a question down here and then I'll go with you. Well, go ahead. Okay. Well, um, Donald Curtis, I work in the Center for Community Engagement and, and uh, Campus Life. And we have programs that connect students with nonprofits on an ongoing basis. Students are working with, um, with uh, organizations 40 hours a semester. Um, doing projects beyond just administrative things or actually helping organizations plan out different strategies and carry projects through. Um, that was one way in which we, we, we kind of bring the outside world into, into the, um, the classroom for the student uh, and giving the student a chance to look at the practical kind of applications and, and compare those with the theories that are getting in the classroom sometimes. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm often kind of baffled by is we have these connections with nonprofits, we have students connecting with, with nonprofit leaders, but there still needs to be some training around networking. How do they follow through with these different relationships? And if there's any way in which, or any, um, uh, I guess, programs or workshops that anybody in the room offers to do that, to help these students understand how to, you know, make those kind of connections and follow up with emails or send an email. Um, if I can just, uh, so I. I have very generous guest speakers and they always um, write their email mm -hmm. and, and so they, they give their contact information out and I always encourage and like I, I had that little lecture on here's how you can follow up with them and here's what you could do next and um, explaining like 
you know, always send a thank you at least. You can even do the thank you card in addition to an email. If you want to meet with them, here's how you request an informational interview. And I literally, this is how the email will look down and if they don't respond to you. And it's like, so I take them through all of that. And I say also, well, if you don't want to go for coffee now, you could add them on LinkedIn, but make sure you specialize the request. And so I do, and a lot of them have built relationships with the guest speakers through that. Um, well, two things. First, I want to say that at the graduate level, particularly, it, I agree completely with Stu. Was it? Um, often the students come in with years and years of life experience, and if the professor doesn't take the time to know what they have to offer, then they can sit there feeling like, "Man, I've been doing this for five years, and you know nobody's asking me." So that's frustrating for them. So I think that's a really good reminder for us. I wanted to just share something strange that had happened <laughs> in our Global Environmental Policy Program, and if other programs could replicate it, um, that would be great for this topic, but I don't, we didn't set out to do it. It did itself. Um, there's, a, you know, every program has a listserv, and our listserv ended up, um, it's got more than 500 people on it now, maybe 600 people. They're all alumni and current students. And it, it got so active that um, we had to ask the advising office to create their own separate listserv because it was driving our alumni away when they said, you know, advising hours are closed today. You know, the, um, but so we're very disciplined and it's all uh, job leads and internship leads and public events and that's it. And yet there's no moderator. They know every once in a while I have to write this isn't the place for looking for a roommate or for selling a bicycle, you know, but um, or every once in a while they'll respond to something on the listserv with something personal and then funny. Um, but I'm amazed how many people have stayed on that listserv and what an amazing opportunity that is for people to network. Because I think for whatever reason, our alumni are genuinely eager to share these opportunities with current students. So, yeah. I think it's also important that we remind our students what they're learning just by, well, just by being in college. Um, so my viewpoint is very practical. Students are applying for graduate programs in medicine, but yeah, they need to know the sciences, they need to have a good GPA, they need to have a good MCAT score, but they also need to have and to be able to demonstrate interpersonal skills and intrapersonal skills. So all of those um, learning objectives that we're going to be talking about at lunch, critical thinking, communication, being able to work in a team, all of these things are very important for students regardless of what profession they're going to be engaging in after graduation and reminding these students that they have these skills, that <laughs> they've learned how to work in a team, hopefully. They've learned how to critically analyze material, hopefully, within their area, I think is also really important and there are a number of different ways to do this. I uh, also encourage them to run for student government, encourage them to take on leadership positions on campus activities. And I, I bring in student government leaders and different leaders talking about, okay, here's what the process is, here's how you can do this, because I think that's incredibly, I mean, that's resume experience um, for them as well. And so ask them to run for office. And I encourage the students to take advantage of alumni groups, especially if they're uh, moving out of the area. Um, I say, look, you know, you're going to Denver, you're going to Los Angeles, wherever you're going, there's a group of AU uh, SOC uh, grads that are already there that are willing to help you. They, 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 there really is sort of a secret cult-like handshake of people <laughs> you know, going through the program that you've gone through, uh, and they're more than willing to be helpful. So I think that's another resource that the students need to be aware of. Going along with what Pamela said, it's important to not only realize, hey, I'm a good team player, but to be able to demonstrate that, have a story, have a, an example, I'm a good team player because I did this, or a written, anyway, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Robin. I work in agricultural management in the at AU, and um, I wanted to know how you guys address like challenges or you know what solutions for like, non-traditional students. And the people that are veteran or people that are you know, undergraduate that are 25 to 35, you know, the people that are new returning to schools, you know, mothers, um, first time generation, uh, how do you, um, I don't know, 
do with the challenges of these groups, especially, especially trying to link the curriculum work. But they may have worked before undergraduate um, and you know, tying them into all of the activities. Um, because I know they, they might feel intimidated or they might not fit in with a lot of some of the structures that are already in place. You, know, you tell a person that an undergraduate and 35 years old about internships and that's not something that they're really, uh, you know, you can't make the connection. <laughs> it's really hard because of the place they are in their lives. How do you guys deal with those connections? I think one of the things that's that's most important when you do have a student that's non-traditional is for them the challenge is about learning to be a student again. And what we have to remind them of is all of that life experience is imminently um, applicable in the classroom and it's highly applicable in the job search. That it is that idea of the transferable skills and that what they've been doing previously um, is still relevant, still has value. Um, and so I think that part of the challenge is um, reaffirming the importance of what it is that they've done before and helping them understand that how it does translate, but then also helping them understand it, how much it has to do with just the confidence of the experience. That for them, they already know how to go out and to work and to do those kinds of things that the traditional student struggles with. And the challenge for them is to, is to kind of get back in the classroom or to get in the classroom. And so the more that, um, at least from my experience, the more that you can help them understand what their particular challenge is and understand what the strengths are that they're bringing in, that they have strengths that the traditional students um, would really benefit from. So it kind of it hits that point that you were saying about, you know, how do you acknowledge what they already are bringing into the classroom, that those skills that they have are really relevant and just increasing that confidence um, because so much for non-traditional learners is about the confidence gap. I have a program for post-baccalaureate students. These are students who have a bachelor's degree and um, have decided that they would like to go to medical school. So I have folks who have just graduated from college all the way up to people who have served 20 years in the armed services and retired and are looking for a second career. Um, so a wide variety of folks. Um, and I agree that, that one of the issues is re, uh, helping the students get back in the classroom, um, reminding them what it's like to be a student and being available on their advisor, some available is it, to help them with a number of issues. I have students who are dealing with um, um, newborns at home, so they're trying to do their chemistry homework <laughs> while they're <laughs> holding the baby who's colicky and crying and, and trying to help them find, find child care options, etc. Um, one there are two things that I, I, I help to do with them. I put them to get, uh, create a small community so all the postbacks can interact with each other and they can talk about issues that they're, they're all working with and help each other to overcome some of these issues. Um, and I also find that uh, most of the postbacks work very well with the undergrads. Um, I emphasize that they're, they have more life experiences and they can serve in a type of mentorship, mentorship type role with the undergrads, so they can bring a lot to, to the plate, um, leadership type experiences that can help the undergrads. So it gives them kind of a different role. It helps them to, to do well in the classes. Um, this, I think you raise a very, very important point, and it's one that we've really been trying to focus on and think about, um, as particularly as, we've ha as we are having a significantly changing demographic um, happening among our student body here at AU. So uh, some of the lessons that, you know, we are also in the process of learning and trying to figure out how best to deal with uh, the issues that arise. And among them, uh, some of the lessons that we have learned or are in the process of learning are that different groups have different needs so that there isn't one answer for all. It's a complex question that we need to really be thinking about. And another piece is that um, I was surprised, I used the example of first gen, right? It's not to make assumptions um, about, and to ask them, I think Lynn, you were really uh, talking about that as well, to really go to them and try to figure out what their needs are and make sure that you, that they know in the classroom that the, fa the faculty member is open to that discussion and is aware and thoughtful about the differences that might exist within the classroom so with first gen to use them as an example, I was really thinking about it 
at first in the sort of deficit model, right? Is that they have these lacks, they don't know, they don't have networks, they don't have et cetera, et cetera. And um, in a conversation with Tiffany Speaks, who had CDI um, here, she said, she, she shared with me that she had done a focus group with our first gen students and asked them to write descriptive words of themselves. And she showed me the piece of paper and it was really interesting. They were all, all the words that came up were very positive words. It was striver and groundbreaker and, uh, you know, uh, first, <laughs> you know, kind of um, those kinds of words. And so they viewed themselves very differently than perhaps how we had been thinking about it. And I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind as you're mm -hmm. thinking about the different students that you're working with. Um, I'm going to mention the AU Eagle Internship Fund, which is something new for those students who are Pell eligible, and some of our non-traditional students may fall into this role. We now have an internship fund for not-for-profit organizations that don't pay. A student can apply. Um, there's a limited number. It's first come, first serve. There's an application. The, the one requirement is you must be Pell eligible. So that can help some of those students who they hear the word internship and they think, I can't do an unpaid internship because I have to have a paid job. This is something that, that can help. Um, right now, for just the eligibility is one of the guidelines so that we can find that cutoff point. And how many do we have any benefit grants this year? Well, we haven't yet finalized um, the, the, the final number, but we have 40 qualified applicants at this point, and we're in the process of just trying to make the decisions of how many of those we can cover. I'm hopeful we'll be able to cover all of them. Those students that are Pell eligible should have received an email for this. So. Right. They would have been contacted. I just want to say briefly that my experience with some of these mid-career people has been quite mixed. And uh, I work really hard counseling them as they're coming in to help them to help figure out whether they really are going to get from the program what they hope. Often they're lost for some reason and they think, Oh, I'm going to come back and get an MA and that's going to fix me and <laughs> half the time it's not and if you can head those people off it's really better I mean that's not true in all cases but I can think of quite a few that came for one semester and then didn't stay so uh, it is different unfortunately you know in our society it's different um, for a middle-aged person so. and uh, another person she desperately wanted to get out of this IT business did a brilliant job in our program but she was so qualified in IT, she just couldn't break out of it. They kept hiring her in IT. And, you know, I was just going to add in, of course, I mean, um, from the career perspective, we love to work with them as career counselors to help them understand the value that they bring and help them identify those transferable skills so that they can start to learn how to market themselves. Um, because it's really just a, they're shifting the market. Um, and how they're presenting themselves. Um, I don't know, but yeah. most of my staff love we, 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 we do. We, we definitely will sit down with them, and they'll say, "Oh, this job isn't relevant." And they'll help them see how it is relevant. So, my, lots of times, the jobs they've had before they did undergrad are really, really honing those, those interpersonal skills that, that Lynn was mentioning and that Pam was mentioning, and really help them to see that yeah, there's a lot of value, even if it doesn't seem directly relevant. We can help them craft a resume that will, that will help to reflect that. So, we would strongly encourage all the students to not be intimidated or afraid or whatever is coming to the career center to see a career advisor and, and to be really honest about what their career background is because all of it, everything's relevant. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so you'll see sometimes those folks will try to like chop off anything they did before they got to AU. I'm like, okay, I can look at you and know that you did something before 2011. <laughs> so, you know, tell me about it and then we can, can integrate that a little better. Yeah. I have a question. Um, in uh, my division, film and, me film and media arts, I have several students at uh, the graduate level coming to me already saying, I mean saying, you know, do you know about internships? Can you connect me? And I say, you know, there's a career center, and I don't know what happens here, but I don't know um, that they, my classes, don't see the career center as something to go to, to get an internship or to get a connection. Is there this connect? What is this? We do have, so we have a service called AU Career Web, where employers go on and post internships. Um, our advisors also often get frequent emails, and we also get them from staff and in, in faculty and SOC, and they put them out in the newsletter internship that we become aware of. So there are, it's not a comprehensive database of every internship in the area or anything like that, but it is one resource that they could use 
and they would talk, um, particularly with Julia Beyer and, and film, about how to find those internship opportunities on their own, whether they're in our database or in other resources, and you know, put them up for organizations like Women in Film and Video and things like that. So we're a resource. We don't give them an internship. But we do have internship listings that do come through us that are posted on AU Career Web and that do get pushed out through our particular newsletter, which all of your students should be getting, the SSC Spot newsletter. So, so we're one of the resources to help. Um, I have a big, broad, overarching question for the panel and then for the audience. And what are some things that you think the university could be doing at a university level to help promote this idea of integrating or connecting curriculum to career? Big question. Something that SOC does, uh, something that SOC does is um, elevate certain internships to the level of dean, dean's internships, um, and those are really plum positions at uh, high-powered media outlets. Um, you know, I think, and I think it works. It, it creates a competitive uh, situation to get the best students into the best internships, and it shows that from the dean's office. Uh, on down, everybody's very supportive of this concept. This is something that there's been other discussions about, but the, the role of the internship course and how on a university-wide level it can be improved. Uh, the relationship between the faculty member and the student, but also between the university and the internship supervisor. The level of academic connection as, as what I was talking about before, um, but also streamlining certain things like internship contracts and making the process that much more user friendly for the faculty member, for the student, and for the internship. Uh, yes. Uh, one thing that was very helpful for me as a student, I'm a PhD student in SOC, um, coming in, and, and I understand that that's not possible at all levels um, of education, but for me coming in, and we have like one mentor we work uh, really closely with, and it's really not only like a resource to learn uh, teaching strategies and do research, but also someone who's really like, has uh, shares our research interests and really like connects us to people for fellowships and things like that. I spend a lot of my time looking at the different learning outcomes for our different majors and very few of them have uh, as a learning outcome for the students to be able to connect the major with the real world. Uh, and Lynn's already mentioned this, it's a great learning outcome and I think it's something we all want for our students but we're not articulating it as majors and departments. So you might want to add it in your syllabus. You might want to add it in if you have any influence on your departmental learning outcomes. You might want to see that it's added in there. I don't know if you want to add one. Any other thoughts on that? My, my big question? Oh, you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> 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 any other questions for my panelists or, or examples that you all have for your, pers for your personal experiences? Uh, just to add to the question that you're asking, and I, I think has been mentioned a few times mm -hmm. here. Um, just last semester I had a, a serial entrepreneur speak to my class and he basically gave up a percentage of his company, his startup company, to be able to get access to the LinkedIn of a, 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 a an organization that helps start. And it really opened my mind to sort of how the value that LinkedIn can have to students. The informational interviews can sort of, if you have an informational interview, can now I, I, I link in with you, but that means that I, as a student, can look at all of those connections and will you give me entree to these people who really might be the perfect person to that, to that first job. And something that I've done over the last five years is I've being a semester made my students linked in with me. So not only that they, I can keep track of their careers and all of that, but that they can look at my past students and see what they've done over the course of their career. And if they want mentoring, um, I can make that connection. So it's like, you know, LinkedIn is sort of Facebook for adults. And I don't feel comfortable with the whole Facebook thing, but the LinkedIn thing I think is, is really very appropriate for this. I really agree with this. Um, just in this last 
few days being in New York for the visits, um, two words came up repeatedly. I think every single site um, talked about uh, internships. You know, the advice was to intern, 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 and then also network, 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 and affiliated with network. Virtually everybody said the word LinkedIn. You yeah, know, sort of as part of kind of having a an active LinkedIn presence and to link with the people. Um, and most of them offer themselves up to kind of. And, yeah, in the, I'll just forget, in the Career Center, we have two regular ongoing courses that are offered about twice a semester. We have a series called Hashtag I Need a Job, um, mm -hmm. and speaking of Twitter ease, but one of them is on job search and networking, and the other one is explicitly on LinkedIn to help students get set up with their profile and understand how to do the connections. So if you want to refer your students to that, please do. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think the, the great thing is that making that distinction that LinkedIn is awesome, and we definitely try to get students onto LinkedIn as much as possible because it does serve such a great uh, as a resource to alumni as well as other professionals. But also, um, if I could just make a plea that you help them understand how it is different from Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> how they need to be professional, and that's how they need to be thinking about it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Richard Fields. I'm an MFA student here at AU. Um, I can't speak on necessarily AU's process, but from my experience in undergrad, um, it seemed like the internship was the end all be all to getting the job, whereas there wasn't enough emphasis on the importance of networking once you get the internship. Ah. You know, so it's not like the, the internship doesn't guarantee you the next job, it's the impression you make on your coworkers, your supervisors, things like that. Like that's when the real networking starts mm -hmm. to get you to, to the next level, is, is once you get your foot in the door at the internship. So you feel like there wasn't enough education on that aspect of one of the reasons to intern as you Right, because it. everything was geared towards getting the internship, okay. but then once you get it, then what, what, what do you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can also add, um, you know, maybe something for students who continue to do you know, internship after internship after internship. Um, you know, there are people out there, students out there, graduate students who you know, might be in their late thirties and all the time on their friends and are internships and actually you know, figuring out how to you know get jobs from these internships or you know maybe it's the way they're putting their experience on their resume, how it should lead to a job, how they're using the language in the cover letter to lead to you know a job. But I think there's some um, you know folks out there that are uh, chronic. That's what we probably talk one on one to one of the career advisors for looking at ways to change that up a bit. Whether it's sometimes you can even sometimes talk to a former intern employer and they'll agree that you could change the title on the resume if that's appropriate. But it is a very much a case by case, and sometimes you need to talk about the fact that they really should not take another internship if they're qualified for a job. Mm -hmm. That that can take some confidence building. So that's really gets into if you run into those, please encourage them for a one on one with their career advisor to help chat through that and maybe to build them up to, to not keep doing serial internships after undergraduate. Other questions or comments from my panel? Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your participation and particularly to my panelists for providing such great insight and ideas.